Father, we thank you again for this day and for your goodness to us. We thank you for the privilege, the sheer privilege that we have of being here today in your presence. And so, Lord, we invite you today to not only be here, but to work in our lives and in our hearts to help us to focus our attention on you and to be uh, close to you today. Draw us close to you today, I pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. Well, good morning. We're thrilled that you're here to worship, and some folks are back with us today that we're thrilled that are here. Um, this is the last Sunday of August. I know that's hard to believe. The um, summer is about over. So in your um, list, in your bulletin there, there's some upcoming events for September. Um, in the back, there's some open windows and some magazines. Um, if, you're getting, if you're keeping up with your open windows, that'll start again this week, so you'll want a new one of those. Um, don't miss that choir practice has started back as well. And um, woohoo! And, um, and the connection card there on the right, if you have anything that you want to share um, with the deacons and the um, interim pastor and the leadership, um, just fill that out. Or if you want to visit from somebody or you have something that you need, um, just fill that out and stick it in the box in the back um, on your way out. So welcome to worship. The more I know your power, Lord, the more I'm mindful how casually we speak and sing your name. How often we have come to you with no fear or wonder and called upon you only for what we stand to gain. God forbid that I find you so familiar that I think of you as less than who you are. God forbid that I should speak of you at all without a humble reverence in my heart. God Lord, I often talk about your love and mercy, how it seems to me your goodness has no end. It frightens me to think that I could take you for granted, though you're closer than a brother, you are more than just my friend. God forbid that I find you so familiar that I think of you as less than who you are. God forbid that I should speak of you at all without a humble
Thank you, Lisa. I think that is an old Point of Grace song, if memory is correct. Um, it was pretty profound for me because it really got my attention spiritually. Well, we should not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. And sometimes that means it's just taken too lightly, taking it too tritely. God forbid. Well, a couple of weeks ago, your leaders had a church planning meeting, I suppose at church council. And uh, Cali Day, it seems like time is just eroding. It's, it's passing so fast. August the 27th. No way. Golly day. A few more days, they're going to be putting out Christmas decorations at Lowe's and Home Depot. You can count on that. That's going to happen quickly now. We were talking about things when it was 102 degrees outside, like trunk or treat. And we were talking about uh, Thanksgiving services, and then we were talking about Advent and about going caroling and all that, and it's right around the corner. Praise be. Beautiful, wonderful time of year for me and my house, I think. I want to read two passages of Scripture, and then I want to pray, and then I want to unpack it a little bit. The first one is in Romans 14. I wonder if you might turn to that. Romans 14. These are basic laws of civility, things that we have to really take to heart in the way that we relate to one another and in the way that we relate to our community. I want to begin reading with Romans 14.10 through the end of the chapter. Why do you judge your brother? Why do you show contempt for your brother? We shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us shall give an account of himself to God. Therefore let us judge one another, not judge one another anymore, but rather resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in our brother's way. We need to resolve not to be a stumbling block. I know and I'm convinced by the Lord that there is nothing unclean of itself, But to him who considers anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. Yet if your brother is grieved because of your food, you're no longer walking in love. Do not destroy with your food the one for whom Christ died. Therefore do not let your good be spoken of as evil. The kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but it is righteousness and peace and joy and the Holy Spirit. He who serves Christ in these things is acceptable to God and approved by men. Therefore, let us pursue the things that make for peace and the things by which we may edify one another. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for the man who eats with offense. It is good neither to eat meat nor drink wine nor do anything by which your brother stumbles or is offended or is made weak. You have faith, have it to yourself before God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself in what he approves. Let's go now. Please turn over just a page or two to 1 Corinthians, the 8th chapter, a page or five. The 8th chapter of 1 Corinthians, I read again. The entire chapter. Concerning things offered to idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffs up. Love edifies. If anyone thinks that he knows anything, he knows nothing, yet as he ought to know. If anyone loves God, this one is known by him. Therefore, concerning the eating of things offered to idols, we know that an idol is nothing in this world, that there is no other God but one. Even if there were so-called gods in heaven or earth, as there are many gods and many lords, people make God out of lots of things. You can make a God out of fishing or golf. You can make a God out of anything, an idol out of anything. Yet, as there is one God, the Father, 
of whom are all things, and we for him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, and through whom we live. However, there is not in every one that knowledge, for some with consciousness of the idol until now eat it as a thing offered as an idol, and their conscience being weak is then defiled. When they go against their conscience, although it didn't previously matter, now it matters an awful lot. They become weak and defiled. Food does not commend us to God, for neither if we eat are we the better, nor if we do not eat are we the worse. But beware, lest some, somehow this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to those who are weak. If anyone sees you have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, will not the conscience of him who is weak be emboldened to eat those things offered to idols? And because of your knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died? When you thus sin against the brethren and you wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food makes my brother to stumble, I will never again eat meat lest I make my brother stumble. This is Paul saying, I will modify the way that I live, and the freedoms that I know that I have, if it becomes a stumbling block to my brother. I will modify the way that I live. So I'm going to say early, the context, timing, and company make all the difference. It is definitely a type of situational ethic. Let's pray. Our Father, I pray that thy will would be done on earth as it is known and desired in heaven, you are hallowed among us. We hold you in absolutely the highest possible regard. Thank you for providing for our daily bread. Thank you for providing for our spiritual nourishment right here in this house this day. I thank you for the churches of the kingdom of God spread throughout the Father's world. And I pray, dear Lord, that you're way would be desired and made known and followed wherever it is that we meet in Jesus' name. No matter the color of our skin or the dialect of our language, take glory and take joy, my King, in what you see and hear from your people this day, I pray, in the name that has always been above all names, the name of Jesus of eternity, I pray. Amen. Well, this week has been kind of dynamic in a lot of ways. And one way inspired this message this morning. I got a text from a young man who was very tense, very aggravated and animated. And he basically was saying, I cannot believe what is happening to our world and to our country. I just cannot believe it. Things are happening now at such breakneck speed that we couldn't even have imagined 20 years ago. He didn't say that, but I've talked to him before. And what he's been doing, as many of us probably have, is he's been watching an awful lot of news, been watching congressional hearings, both in the Senate chambers and in the House, been watching some things unearthed by interrogators in the Justice Department, the State Department, Homeland Security, IRS, on and on. And he's distraught, angry. Some of his words are all but venomous, not vulgar, just words of anger. My response to him is, yes, the world is tilting, to be sure, and our country leading the way. But this is no surprise to Jesus whatsoever. He is not surprised. It is not out of control from his purview. There is indeed an epidemic of injustice. But he knows all about it. 
Well, what do we do then? So for one thing, we're supposed to love our enemies. So you're saying that Jesus is okay with this? No, I'm not saying that at all. But I am saying that when injustice abounds, we are supposed to, in the words of the prophet, love justice. And we're supposed to do mercy. So even if we adjudicate a person as guilty and on the wrong side of the line of scrimmage, we are still supposed to do mercy, which is be a presence of Christ to those persons. And we are supposed to walk humbly before our God. These are things that we must do. And we cannot be victimized nor pulled down by the vortex. We cannot be. We must remain a change agent. Antennas up, not deceived, always gracious, always loving, and truthful. Now he got mad at me. Because he said, so you're on that side too. And I said, all contraire. Oh no, not at all. Not to any degree. But I do believe that we are to be a presence of Christ in any environment. I wrote this little message this morning. When your life is a stage, be gentle. And I lift it, then the thoughts of it, from Romans 14 and from 1 Corinthians, the 8th chapter. Paul was in such a quandary. Let's think for a moment and ask a question. Can a public person be a private person? Do public people surrender their private lives when they opt to live in the spotlight before the cameras or in community? Is the private life then set on the side? I recall uh, a couple of years ago, a pop star named Britney Spears. Uh, rather dangerously and at high speed ran through a red light, was pulled over, and her explanation was that she was being hotly pursued by paparazzi and all she was trying to do is hold on to some semblance of a private life. Can she reasonably do that? You'll remember Princess Di. Her death may have been due, at least in part, to the prying eyes of the paparazzi that relentlessly at high speed were chasing her and her driver and her boyfriend through a tunnel. She was so frustrated by constant invasions of privacy. America's presidents, up until very late, have had their medical procedures, evaluations, made public to broadcast news. The public wants to know about all the celebrities. We just want to know. The media demands full disclosure. And public people, by and large, resist those attempts at invasions and stripping away of what they would regard as private freedoms or individual and personal freedoms. So there is this tension. The tension is between personal freedoms and restriction. Can a public person be a private person? And what has that tension to do with us? You might say, Pastor Ed, what is this message even to do with us? I'm not a pop singer. I'm not a celebrity, I'm not a politician, I'm just a citizen, I'm not a public person. David, would you mind singing this little light of mine from the scripture? I'm going to, I'm kidding, you don't have to do that. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine, put it under a bushel, no! Is that not from the scripture? No, not expressly, but it is implicitly. The one that walked out of the tomb says to us, you are the light of the world. 
and let your light so shine before men that they will see your good works and glorify the Father which is in heaven. The one that walked out of the tomb says that the lit lamp belongs on a candlestick, giving light, illumination, and revelation to all that are in the house. So much for privacy. The Apostle Paul said that we are living epistles and read by men. Kings, priests, and ambassadors, so much for privacy. We are public figures, each and every one of us, if we are in the will of God. That being settled, how then shall we live? What do we make of that? How do we exercise our personal freedoms and convictions, our spiritual liberties in a public context? <coughs> Excuse me. Let's be guided by a few civil principles for living in the public eye. First of all, here it is, my words, gently pursue your right to freedom. That's what 1 Corinthians, the 8th chapter, is advocating for. Charlie and Linda are here. Hi. Why, I thought you went back up north. Don't. <laughs> Somebody grab them. <laughs> Our Lord is asking for love and consideration to be the guiding factor in the exercising of our freedoms. Our modern culture, in a couple of iterations and swings of the pendulum, have made more and then much less of what the First Amendment is supposed to mean. We can't just say anything anywhere to anybody. That's one swing of the pendulum. That makes no sense at all, and that was not the purpose of the Founding Fathers. But when we do have honest disagreement culturally, politically, militarily, whatever it might be, we must reserve the right to speak that. And no one should be able to abridge that right with censorship. That is the other swing of the pendulum. And that's why Elon Musk is persona non grata among much of our country because he believes that we ought to be able to and we are responsible for speaking truth to power. People ought to have that liberty. Not to say dangerous, incendiary things. There's fire in this theater, you can't do that. But we can and we must speak truth to power. So he's become persona non grata for that. And people may say, well, there are other reasons, and maybe there are, but that's the way that I interpret it. Paul warns that knowledge and liberties that are unbridled by sensitivity can be very harmful, very hurtful. Rights of behavior without consideration of second and third order effects should be tempered and restrained. Because just blurting out and acting out can lead to a lot of bad things. For one thing, if it goes no further than us, it can lead to spiritual pride. And God resists spiritual pride. So that's a very bad thing when we would be resisted by God. Gone unchecked, it can lead to social arrogance. People are just being arrogant with their purported spiritual liberties whereby God and man would resist us. Paul said, we know that meat that's offered to idols is absolutely nothing 
He also said, we know that some knowledge bloats up and it puffs up, whereby God would resist us. How many of us like being around spiritual strutters? If you've got a few gray hairs, you probably have seen some spiritual strutters. They are like the NBC peacock. They are giving off their airs. I know what you don't know. I've been farther than you've been. I've been deeper than you have. I have something that you don't. That is arrogance when a person gives off those airs. Pure knowledge, even presentation of fact, that is void of grace and deference, sensitivity and gentility, can tear down our witness, and it can build up walls. On the other hand, love that accepts and understands and has the wisdom of situational awareness can edify and build up and tear down those walls. And the question is, how are we going to act? How are we going to speak? Do you remember Joseph of the Old, of the Old Testament? There are two Josephs. There are more than that. But there was a Joseph of the Old Testament Son of Jacob, had a bunch of brothers, right? He had a dream, he had a vision. And he couldn't wait to get out and to tell his brothers about that vision. Hey, God's going to make me to be a very important person. And guess what? I'm going to be your ruler. And you're going to serve me. Isn't that wonderful? I don't think so. Not to the rest of the brothers. Well, that's what the Heavenly Father has given me, this wonderful vision. And guess what our earthly father, Dad Jacob, has given me? A coat of many colors. It's just beautiful. Take a look at this guy. See that technicolor coat? Y'all got one? Oh, no, it's only me. You know what the rest of the brothers thought? Reuben and Dan and the guys? We need to dig us a hole way out in the desert, and we need to drop this peacock in that hole. Let the tarantulas take care of it. And that is precisely what they did. Vision is a good thing. The blessing of Father Jacob is a good thing. Then when you add a good thing to a good thing and you add insensitivity, it becomes a disaster. Some silly people still say, and I've heard it even this week, I don't care what people think. Jesus does. The Holy Spirit cares what people think. The aggressive in-your-face attitude and freedoms, purportedly, of the Corinthians were offensive to other people and put other people off when they were supposed to attract other people to the gospel. Why do people even among us this day in the 21st century dress in such exaggerated ways, such impractical ways, dare I say, such offensive ways. Some people dress out on the street in an offensive way to sensibility. And that is very intentional. Already in Polk County, and coming more to Polk County by their design, a troop of drag queens and they wear the big hair, the purple hair, the pink hair, the green hair, all the above. And they wear exaggerated lipstick and eyeshadow and eyelashes and skin tight everything and very little of it, you know, many of them. And they look very, very clownish. They look obscene and insane. Now, what these drag queens are doing 
is they are flaunting their liberty to do it as over against sensibility, and the intention is to be confrontational and to be appealing to children who have always loved clowns. Most children have loved clowns, so they look very clownish. To me, they look very stupid. How's that for plain talking? And I don't mean to be insensitive, I just mean to be accurate. And it's coming, and it's already been, to attract the children, to offend the sensibilities of others, and to purportedly advance the cause of the drag queens. Biblical compassion insists on accommodation, but sometimes that accommodation just goes too far. For instance, in several American cities, when the traveling troop of drag queens have come in, if people stood on the opposite corner and prayed, they were arrested. If they stood on the other side of the street with a sign that had a verse of scripture, you know, if any man's in Christ, he's a new creation, or something like that, I don't know what it might be, they're arrested. So some of that stuff just goes way too far, to be sure. Here's another clue for a rule to civility. Gently pursue your rights to liberty. I want to read from 1 Corinthians 8 and the 7th through the 9th. Not everyone has knowledge, some with consciousness of the idol. Until now they eat it as a thing offered to an idol, and their conscience then being weak is defiled. Food, to, food does not commend us to God, neither if we eat or are we the better, or if we do not eat, are we the worse. It's not a matter of that. Beware lest somehow this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to those that are weak. Don't take something good and make something bad out of it. The first point deals with freedoms, and the second point deals with actions. There were uninformed believers on both sides of this issue of meat offered to idols. Some thought, if I eat this, no problem in this world. I don't believe in idols. I don't even believe in this temple cultus. It's just prime rib. I'm going to have it, and I'm going to enjoy it. Some thought that, and others thought you cannot touch that. It's consecrated. It's sanctified to the idols. We invoke the curse. And then there was another group that would say, wait a minute. Hey, I, I do see this meat offered to idols and sacrifices as, as some sort of legitimate spiritual exercise, but those guys over there are just eating it. And I think even though I feel I shouldn't, I will. And when they do our Lord tells us they have fallen into sin. So the people that said, oh, it's nothing, it's just prime rib, they're right. And then when they eat it, they're wrong. They're wrong because they cause others to stumble and they are weaker. Others would go against their conscience and defile themselves. There is nothing unclean in and of itself, Romans 14, 14, but to him who considers it to be unclean, to him it is. We can actually lead other people to sin by inconsiderate and inappropriate verbiage and action. Do you believe that? That we can cause people to sin with our inconsideration and behavior? In and of itself, it would pose no problem. But when others see it, and then they rationalize their own behaviors, it becomes a problem. If we pursue that inconsiderate spiritual bull in a china shop modality, we do damage. It's an inconsiderate path. It's not a path of righteousness. We're no longer, Romans 14 would say, walking in love. Simply put, context, timing, company, really should inform us in the way that we live and the way that we speak. We must be aware 
the military would say situationally. We must have situational awareness and a tendency toward self-sacrifice and deference. Ask yourselves, how might others interpret my actions and my words here? How might they be affected by my behavior? Oncologists is a very special uh, medical profession. They are cancer doctors. They know almost to a person that they can kill the cancer. They can kill the cancer. That is undisputed. The trick is to keep the patient alive while they kill the cancer. In our military, if we see a cell of uh, Al-Qaeda somewhere in a village in the mountains in Afghanistan, of course we're out of Afghanistan now, but if we had, we always knew that we could kill the Al-Qaeda cell. We could obliterate it. But what would happen to the rest of the village? We had to be very precise in our actions and not over-respond. Our liberties are always tempered by our civilities. If you read verse 17 of Romans 14, you see that we are liberated. And if you read verse 15, you see that we are restrained at the same time by that phenomena called love. Grasp that. Rubber hits the road. If you conclude that it is perfectly acceptable in God's sight for you to have wine at home with your dinner. Fine. Great. Who cares? On the other hand, if you conclude, well then, I think it would be okay for me to go to Applebee's during happy hour in order to of everything, wearing my Parkland Baptist Church t-shirt. Can you see the difference? It's context. It's timing. It's company. Because what might some person think when they see, well, there, well there's one of the deacons at Parkland Baptist Church. And look at him, he's half lit. He probably drove here. How's he going to get home safely? Ah, uh, ah, uh, well, if okay for him, certainly okay for me. And people have justified their extremes by the moderation of others. So be careful, be careful. And I, I, I use this example. Vicky's lived this example. We used to live in the Shenandoah Valley in Virginia. Years ago, I was a pastor and I was in the reserve. And I got called up by something called Afghanistan, back to active duty. Well, in the reserve and a pastor in a big church in town. And Vicki and I lived out of town on a, a small horse farm. No one lived out there. I mean, it was a lonely, huh, wonderful existence. We just had our horses, we had our cows, we had our acreage. I was busy, busy, busy. On Sunday morning, I would go in early and pray with the deacons. I would follow that by teaching Sunday school. Follow that by the 9.30 worship service. Follow that by the 11 o'clock worship service. Follow that by going home for a while and coming back in time for the 6 o'clock p.m. worship service. Got that? Four teaching environments in one day. Sunday was anything for me but Sabbath. Sunday was not my Sabbath. It might have been Sabbath to the rest of the community, but not to a busy pastor. Most pastor, a lot of pastors are not busy anymore. But I was busy then, really busy then. So what would I do when I went home to the horse farm with Vicki? I knew that she would understand. One of my favorite things was getting on my 1938 tractor with a seven-foot sickle bar, lowering that sickle bar, and driving through those pastures, mowing grass, mowing grass. Pair of shorts on, depending on the season. In the summer, shirt off, shorts on, bare chested, riding my tractor, mowing the fields. Now, that was not my Sabbath. Friday was my Sabbath. But it was the Sabbath of everyone else. 
on the horse farm, I would mow the fields on Sunday afternoon because it's me, Vicky, and God. And the horses, and they were reprobate anyway. Now, when we lived in town in a parsonage, on Sunday afternoon, I would do no such thing. Why is that? Situational awareness. People driving by. Hey, there's the pastor working on the Sabbath. I didn't want them to see that and then justify them going home and doing their home improvement. I didn't want that to happen. So do you see what I'm saying? Eating the meat, Paul would say, to offer to idols, no big deal. But if I see that it's going to make my brother to stumble, it is a big deal to him, then I'm going to restrain myself. I'm going to be temperate. And I'm not going to do it. Well, this young man sent me that angry text and others. He accused me of agreeing with and accused Jesus of agreeing with and he could not possibly have. And I said, I, I, I totally agree, I totally agree. Well, here, here's the big deal. When your life is a stage, be gentle. What he was doing, he was responding to someone who had sent out a thread with a bunch of people on it. And he thought he's just responding to that guy. And he's at odds with that guy. But he's sending it to the whole world. How intemperate and how angry he is. So the other guy, that guy, writes back and says, I don't think that this thread is appropriate for political issues. Oh, no, no, okay. All right. He said that. And he said, and that, that went to my, my son in Colorado and went to my grandson in Miami or wherever in the world. And I wrote back and I said, sorry, that young man is simply exasperated by everything that's going on. And many are. He simply has not learned temperance. He shouldn't have done that. I didn't say that, but that's what it's saying. He didn't have temperance to restrain himself. And I believe that that's true. We live in volatile times. Now, I was telling Vicki of what I intended to speak here, and she said, but you know, there's another side of the coin where you have to speak certain things. You have to or you're not a leader. And a leader's not supposed to take a poll and see exactly where the people are and then blend in. The definition of leadership is to take people to places that they would not in and of themselves go. To lead. To lead. Sometimes you have to stand up and be counted. The Apostle Paul, who wrote this text, also said, Pray for me that I will be bold in Rome. Pray for me that I will be bold. King David stood on the hillside when he was a ruddy shepherd boy and he saw the armies of Israel cowering and a loud mouthed Philistine on the desert floor shouting up a challenge and blasphemy to them. And he looked around at the Jewish army, his army, and he said, is there not a cause? I will fight Goliath. And he went down on the desert floor and he took on Goliath. You see, so we need to have restraint. We need to have a sense of timing. We need to know the context, the stakes. We need the Holy Spirit to guide us. And rarely do we need to act and speak immediately. We need to take a breath, back up, pause for a moment. And if it's worth saying, then say it. Let the chips fall. And if it's not going to do any good, then don't do it. Just pull it back in. Everybody okay? The epistles are kind of living roomish. It's kind of where we live. And we will find ourselves more and more, more and more on the line of scrimmage. Is there not a cause? Our Father, I thank you for liberty in the church to speak things that matter. 
I pray that we will be a people of long-suffering, gentleness, and wisdom, that we'll be a people of temperance and restraint, and at the same time we'll be a people of boldness that must speak as the sons of Issachar who were very well aware of the times that they lived in. May we be like that as well, I pray. We certainly need a salt of the earth and a light of the world. We certainly need a positive leaven, change agents in our world. I pray, Father, that we have all accepted that task and that privilege, and that we will know that as we stand together in the church of the living God, that the gates of hell will not prevail. I pray, dear God, that it would be so. I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.